Are you an HR department of one trying to figure out how to balance task and strategy while keeping up with changes in regulatory compliance? Do you need a fresh outlook on old topics? Then stop what you're doing, grab your coffee, and get ready to recharge. If you have people, you have problems to solve and things to do. Your host is Brenda Neckvottle, a 20-year human resource professional, ready to explore the HR industry with veterans of business and life with fresh eyes and new ideas. Learn about the rapidly evolving changes in employment law around the country, as well as new tactics to deploy and build engagement in your work workforce. If you're looking to implement new practices to make your job easier in HR, then this podcast is for you. Hello and welcome to Fire in the Valley. Today we have myself, Mighty Pete, and we're joined by Brenda Nekvatal. Have I pronounced that right, first of all? <laughs> no, but that's okay. <laughs> Come on, you got to give us the original and the proper one. Go for it. It's neck bottle. <laughs> neck bottle. And you didn't tell me. I wouldn't mind, but you told me in advance, right? It's like nobody yeah. gets it right. Where's it from? Give us a bit of background first. It's actually my ex husband's name, and uh, it's it's Czechoslovakian. Ah, I like it. Very good. Very good. So, got rid of the husband, kept the name. That's right. That's how that works. <laughs> so, Brenda, welcome to the show. Listen, it's great to have you on. So, tell us who are you, what do you do, and where are you from? Thank you very much. Uh, well, my name is Brenda Neckbottle, and I am an award-winning human resource professional. Um, I am currently living over in Virginia in the United States, and it's snowing outside. So we wear warm clothes right now because we're not used to this kind of weather. It's wet. It's, it's wet and cold and snowing, and none of it sticks. So it goes right to your bones right now. But, you know, it's beautiful to watch. Give us a back. How much, how much snow are we talking here? Are we talking like ridiculous amounts of snow or are we okay? Oh, no, no, no. Well, here in Virginia, a ridiculous amount of snow is about like two to three inches. And then that completely shuts the state down because just we don't have the, we don't have the ability to manage it because we don't get very, we don't get snow very often. So this is just a lot of, this is just flurries flying around and it's just wet. Nothing sticks. <laughs> Story of life, isn't it? Yeah. It's just like, yeah, it's just kind of passes around you know <laughs> well i'm a, so i grew up in pennsylvania i grew up in erie pennsylvania and we get no i mean we get snow there is no snow day i mean like if the buses can't get you to and from school safely and you know and that's a lot <laughs> then yeah then they then they used to shut it down but we'd only like maybe one day out of the year if that you went to school yeah love it so tell us <laughs> award-winning hr yeah. Talk to us about that. So uh, in 2020, um, I was nominated for nine business awards and in a couple of different uh, classifications. Uh, I have a, the podcast that I have was uh, nominated for four awards and won, won two and made the, fi the finals in the top 10 slate. And uh, I've won mostly bronze awards. I've won a silver uh, for my, uh, for, was it was most valuable HR uh, professional. And it was around the work that I did with the response and the, and the COVID virus and helping small businesses and other companies of all kinds of sizes really figure out how do we deal with this pandemic? Holy cow, what do we do? And these new laws are changing. And how do we make sure that, you know, we're, we're doing what's in the best interest of the company. And, you know, they were afraid that they were going to get screwed over by employees and, and it was, you know, it was, it was wild. It was absolutely wild. And between the months of March and April, I had spoken to over 3,500 employers in a wide variety of um, different types of training programs that I was hired for and relatively the similar topics. So it was, it was pretty crazy. So the podcast has won best business podcasts here in the U.S., it won Best Business Podcast internationally as well. Um, I received an award for Achievement in Human Resources um, uh, Startup of the Year for a particular program that I launched in. Um, and then I won uh, Most Valuable Corporate Response and then another one for a Startup of the Year under Business Services. So it's been a busy year. It's been a busy year. <laughs> say the least wow that's quite an impressive collection well done Thank you, you. awesome how, do, how does it feel 
it's really good that, that's actually the that's a ward row right up here behind me oh, so yeah brilliant. it's it feels pretty good yeah, yeah it's all it's i mean it, it is and as is podcasting something you always wanted to do is it you know and that sort of talking out and, and giving out information is that natural for you um being behind a mic actually i'm better behind a mic than i am a video and so people are you know you, you, you do research and study on how to market on social media and they're like oh yeah i make all these videos and i'm like ah, really i don't i don't like how i look on a video i don't like how it feels it's not natural for me but you know because i've you know consulted for so many years it's easy for me to be on a phone and you know conveying quite eloquently most of the time what it is that i'm supposed to say so you know being behind a microphone is very simple for me and uh now that we have clubhouse out which really makes it great because i spend quite a bit of time helping businesses uh you know figure out their people problems and uh teaching hr uh folks both in the just the regular business space but then also in government contracting all the legislative changes that are coming down the pike that are going to impact their organizations and what do they do about it so pretty fun i i really enjoy it <clears throat> yeah i mean clubhouse is a bit of like a tardis at the moment you step in and then four days later you step out again it's like, yeah. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know it is so addictive I, the first day i got into it i was like oh my gosh this is amazing you know like everybody's on that high that clubhouse high right and I was on it all day. I mean, it's like every room I could go in, I went in and just sat and listened and was just gobsmacked about everything I was hearing. It was just fantastic. And, you know, I'm thinking like, okay, so how do I do this? Like, how do I, how do I continue to get my message out? And then I'm listening to one show that like, well, is Clubhouse going to be the death of podcasting? I'm like, no, it's not gonna be the death of podcasting. And, you know, it just changes, it just changes the game a little bit, but you know, once you're done in a room, that's it. There, you don't. There's no saving it, right? So you can't record it, and you, even though there's technology, you can tap into it. You can't logistic. You can't do that based off of their, you know, their user agreement and the services. So podcasting is still very much, very very much the way to go. I mean, Clubhouse is great because it's a wonderful networking tool and it's a wonder wonderful way of getting. And the way that people can communicate and like make connections with each other, you just can't do on social media because now we can hear each other's and we can hear the, the change of our pitch and, you know, the influx of our voice and the tonality and where we're coming from. And, you know, now we can express what we really think is funny just by laughing out loud, like really laughing out loud. And, um, and what we not, what we don't just by being quiet or, you know, voicing our opinion. So clubhouse is clubhouse is a great place. I love being in there it's amazing right technology changes and, and you got to change with it and well, i suppose even from a hr point of view i mean this is going to be it's a whole is it a whole different set of procedures to go with these technologies um from an hr standpoint um no i would say no um you know it's another form of social media and you know if a company has a social media policy it's there's the only difference between written and spoken word is written, you can also capture imagery and it's something that will stay here. It's not going to stay, but it, you know, but here in the US, employees rights are still protected if they are talking about, you know, their workplace condition over here, that's a protected activity. And if they do it with more than one person, if they really want to log into a room, sit there, talk to themselves all day long, they can, but where they, you know, have that conversation with more than one person, that's a concerted and protected activity at that point, concerted meaning more than one person in the group. So they have that ability to do that. Now, if they're going to come out and say, well, you know, did you see Suzanne and she did blah, 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 blah. And she did this. And the other girl, Diane, she goes, yeah, well, I'm going to go over and scrap, you know, crap, you know, clock the crap out of Sammy. And it's like, okay, now we got a little different situation. Now that changes the dynamic. And now employers have skin in the game because that could be, that's actually a direct threat. So, um, and, and the courts have ruled on that. It's definitely different. But do you, I mean, if you're, if it's not being recorded per se, I mean, is it not done hearsay, right? Oh, it's good luck trying to prove it. Exactly. Well, no, you'd you'd have to, you'd have to have the other people in the conversation be willing to 
ante up the, you know, the evidence that they actually, the testimony that they actually said that. Sure. Sure. Yeah. It's, uh, it is that one thing is how do you protect free speech, but at the same time, you know, sort yeah. of mo moderate, it's, you it's know, the, uh, yeah, that's one of the complexities about our country is, you know, you've got people that are willing to fight and die for our freedom and our liberty over here, but yet they're still willing to do it, even though they may not necessarily believe in what the other person has to say. That, that to me is a very special person, somebody who has the ability to look past that. And, you know, over here in the U.S., we've seen a lot of stuff <laughs> last year, you know, a combination of, you know, censorship and a combination of really people exercising the first amendment and people not believing it. And um, in my honest opinion, I think if you shut the media down for three days, you, most of your problems are going to go away. It's always a, it is a tough one, isn't it? It's always the, the, the mix up of the system and, you know, sort of commercialization, governments, free speech, you know, promoted speech, whatever, right? It's a, it's just something you got to wade through. I don't know if there's a happy medium in between it all, but hey. Yeah, every one of the, every news channel out there has been, any major mass media, I should say, has been, you know, called out on their own shenanigans. You know, we've all seen it. We've all heard it. It doesn't matter if it's a conservative or if it's a, a liberal news station. It doesn't matter. They all, they've all done it. And so nobody trusts, nobody trusts anything, but yet everybody's willing to listen to it. So it's, it's kind of a, it's an interesting brain snap. Yeah. But anyway, listen, we're here to talk about you. So tell yeah. us, Brenda, what does fire in the belly mean to you? Oh, I love that. I love that fire in the belly. That is your gumption. I mean, that's fire in the belly is just, you know, your get after life that burns inside of you, that big furnace. Um, a lot of people actually don't know this. I have a tattoo on my back. It's a, a real pretty one. It's a Japanese character and it's a character for fire. And it sits right in between my shoulder blades. It's very petite. It's very pretty looking. It's nothing obnoxious. I don't sprout wings or anything like that, but um, but that's always there for me to remember, don't lose your fire, you know, and, um, and it's, uh, yeah, fire in the belly. It's like, if you don't have that, you're not living. I mean, you're just existing and life. Nobody should be on this life. Nobody should be on this planet to just exist. Everybody should be out trying to live. Do you have fire in your belly then all oh, the time? Yeah. Some of the time, all the time, I, <laughs> all the time. I was on the phone with a friend of mine yesterday. He goes, God, man. And he's like 65. He's very successful. And he's like, man, he says, you just blow me away. And I said, why is that? And he, <laughs> he's like, you've got so many things going on at any given time. He said, you just don't hold still. And one of my best friends, uh, you know, he was in my house for a weekend while his place was something was going on or construction or something like that. And we stayed in the guest bedroom and he's like, you just don't stop moving. And I'm like, I got stuff to do. <laughs> He's like, yeah, but you work all the time. And I'm like, yeah, but you know what? It feeds me, not just on food on the table, but it, it makes me feel good about what I'm accomplishing. So when you love what you do. Sure, why not? I mean, it's, what does it say? You know, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life or something to that nature, right? Yeah. Well, there are days I work. And then there are days that I just get up and get the putter in front of the computer. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what's what's your power or where where do we see brenda absolutely on fire and that's your that's your place that's your go-to what's what's your uh yeah what's your place of of highest flow mm, wow um when i believe it or not it's when i'm actually in front of people and and when i'm in front of a group of people that get it and they start getting into the content that we're talking about <clears throat> Um, you know, when I do, when I, when I do group training classes, um, you know, I work to get the energy up in the room. So that way we get to that point and it's just all of a sudden you get, you know, you got people laughing, they're, they're engaged, they're solving the problem. Um, well, the last time that happened was about a year ago, um, oddly enough. 
And uh, I told the story about how a manager at a company got three women pregnant. <laughs> And everybody got into that one. And, and so, you know, I'm leading them down this path and I was explaining to them, I said, yeah. And they said, what would you do? And they're like, well, we'd fire the guy. And I said, well, what do you do about the women? Cause that's going to be a lot of, you know, money. And now you got an increase in benefits and you may have increase in absenteeism and, and everybody's looking at me. And I finally said, do you finally see this as a business problem? And they're like, yes. I said, okay, so we're away from the drama now, right? And like everybody finally got to that point and everybody was like on their seat, like, okay, so how is she going to deal with this? Like, what is she going to tell us? And I love it when I get people to that point because they're in it, they're involved, they, they feel it and they finally understand that dealing with people sometimes is a business problem. And I don't think a lot of people look, especially small business, they don't see it that way just yet not until somebody lays that storyline out for them. And so when I work with small businesses, that's exactly what we do. And, you know, they, some people just get stuck in the drama and the weeds of what happens in working with their employees. But once they recognize that it's a business issue, that's a paradigm shift. And now it's like, then they can seem to handle it. it it's really interesting to watch it happen. And it's really cool when you see that shift take place. I have to know now what, what would you do? <laughs> what to... Oh, I'd fire the guy. <laughs> if he was a manager and he knocked up three girls, oh, he's gone. <laughs> easy, easy, easy day. <laughs> it's like easy day. And then you'd pray that the other two didn't know anything about what was going on. <laughs> just hope the other, all three don't find out how everything's connected. <laughs> There must be a community, a HR community somewhere where you can anonymously go and share stories because some of it must be like, what, is this for real? You know, is this what, a genuine uh, thing? You know, I would love to put employee stories together, but unfortunately there's risk associated with that on the, on the practitioner level because it's confidential, you know? I mean, sometimes I talk about incidences that take place. I share stories, but there are few, there are few ones that I can share and when I do, I don't tell the whole story. I only tell nuggets of it that I can use to apply to, you know, the, the subject matter that I'm actually talking about. One of the biggest ones that I ever, I've ever mentioned, um, and I, I still work with the CEO of the company at the time. He's now in a different organization. And we had a near stabbing with, uh, between two of, our, two of the employees. And um, one was the instigator and one was the offender. And I tell the story about, um, how, you know, the one started, you know, pecking a fight on the other one and the other one threatened to, you know, cut his throat from ear to ear and with a company issued utility knife, no less. And how, you know, we had him professionally removed, um, you know, from the police and the owner of the company, even though they had a CEO, the owner of the company still worked there as an engineer. And he got really angry at us for calling the cops and what he didn't realize. And I, first off, you know, he got in my face about it and I told him, I said, well, let me tell you, he says, well, I would have handled it. I could have dragged him out. And, and I said, well, I got news for you. I said, he's actually a trained former police officer. And there's a reason why he's not on the force for longer than a year. And I said, I can guarantee you, you would have been the first one dead. Guaranteed it. And he's just, you know, I said, that's a trained individual that needs to be handled by the appropriate parties. So don't think that you can do it yourself because you can't, you have no idea. I mean, <laughs> You have no idea how to handle that. So it gets interesting. I mean, with, with what you're saying, I mean, you must deal with a lot of ego, a lot of pride, a lot of ignorance, a lot of everything, right? You know, you're sort yeah. of, oh, I, th I thought that was a good idea or he said or she said or whatever else, right? You're, you're seeing the, the, the dirty end of the stick. Yeah, it, it, you do. In, in this industry, you do. And you have to be resilient. You have to have thick skin. And that's why, you know, I talk to people about you. So I talk to two people about taking care of themselves in two ways. So when I talk to leaders, the very first thing that I explain to them when we're dealing with a situation is that you have to get yourself right about this situation. What I mean by that is that you have to really deal with your own emotion because you're not going to make good decisions if you don't. And then I talk to the practitioners and I explain to them, I'm like, 
you have to break free and find time for yourself because everything that an HR person does, first off, a CEO or an entrepreneur, an owner of the company, they're going to have more problems than anybody else. They own every problem in the organization, right? And they know that. And, and that's a lot of pressure. And, but when you get to the HR person, they own a lot of problems too, but they are in really a true service position. They wake up in the morning. This is, you know, largely a feminine driven industry. So, you know, you'll have women that wake up in the morning, they get up, they have to take care of their families and help everybody answer, you know, solve problems, everybody else's problems. They get into a car, they go to work to go and solve everybody's problems, then to get into a car and come home and to continue to solve everybody's problems throughout the day. There's, there's hardly no time for them to do anything for themselves. And if they don't strategically make that happen, they're going to burn out. They're going to crack. Um, they're going to feel this narrative will eventually take over in their head that they're not liked. They don't get support. They don't like their job. And it's a really rewarding career but you have to be resilient. You have to take care of yourself. You have to take care of your body. Um, This is a sedentary position and you have to take care of your mindset and you have to protect that. And if you don't, you're just, you're just not going to have a good experience and and your family will suffer as a result of that. And, you know, we have men that are in the same position, you know, men, men occupy this as well, but you know, there's a different dynamic of life that happens for a man than a woman. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. I don't take, I don't take the, I don't, you know, scratch out the A and women. Uh, I don't do that and put in an X. I, you know, I believe that there's, there's benefits to all men and all women. And we all have different, you know, we, we have different traits. I mean, it's just who we are. Um, but, you know, it's a different experience for men than it is for women in HR. I mean, statistically, I mean, just in terms of female male mix in the HR roles, mm-hmm. I mean, is it predominantly more male female or mixed up? What? Predominantly more female. Right. Okay. I what would say your... dirty numbers. It's about seventy five percent female. Easy. Any reason why? It's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that, but there's some pretty phenomenal HR leaders, both. Uh, female and male out there that I've met some pretty amazing people. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a male or a female, you know, if you're, if you're driven to do what's in the, find that delicate balance of doing what's in the best interest of the company and doing what's in the best interest of the, of the employee, uh, you're, you're just going to crush it. You'll absolutely crush it. So I don't think there's really, there's no difference. One is not better than the other. And like I said, we're all individuals anyway. So we all have our unique attributes that we bring to the table. What makes you so wonderful? And I mean that in a very positive way. <laughs> I've never had anybody ask me that question unless they were really pissed at me. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean what the hell makes you so great? <laughs> I mean it in a positive, loving way. I'm looking at the awards there, you know, it's, it's awesome. I've never had anybody ask me that question before. Oh my gosh. You're really starting to peel back the onion here, aren't you? Um, what makes me wonderful? Well, <laughs> I think being a little humble here right now, that probably does it. But um, so we have a mutual acquaintance, Mark Victor Hansen, a mutual friend. He's, um, he's the author of the Chicken Soup, one of the three authors of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series been on the New York times bestselling li- number one list, like what, 136 times he's got 600 and how many books and he's writing two more, I think right now, as we speak, but um, we were on clubhouse the other day and Mark just like, and that was like the one moment where I wish you could record it because I just got the most amazing compliment. So I will share what Mark said and I'll paraphrase it. He introduced me to about 150 people in a room Uh, I'm just literally sitting there. And uh, he said, before we go on, he says, you guys have to get to know Brenda. You have to follow her. She is amazing. He says, she is the most down to earth, kind, funny, generous human being you will ever meet in your life. And she helps Navy SEALs as they go through their career transition and they absolutely love her. So I'm like, that was a pretty big compliment right there. So we'll go with what Mark says. How's that? That's awesome. Can you take a compliment? Are you good at taking compliments? Um, I'm better at it. 
I, I wasn't for a long time. I don't get them very often. Not in HR. You don't get compliments <laughs> often in HR. <laughs> but the one thing that I, I will admit that I did get when I dealt with an employee issue is any employee would tell you that, that, that I'm extremely fair. They may not always like what I have to say or how I go about saying it, but at the end of the day, they are treated like adults and, and they recognize that I'm very fair. Well, I mean, you can't ask more than that. I mean, fair is, you know, is, I think when you see it, other people's points, you know, but yeah, yeah, why not? Well, I believe everybody should have a chance to speak for themselves, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't think everybody gets that. Talk to us about mini Brenda. Say that one more time. Say, talk to me it's about mini Brenda. Little, mini Brenda. little Brenda when she was young. Oh, little Brenda when she was young. So... <laughs> Um, I was a huge Wonder Woman fan when I was a kid, huge. And um, <clears throat> I had a learning disability that went undiagnosed and we didn't know what it was. We knew something was there. Turn, didn't realize it until I was 32 years old that I was dyslexic. So I struggled. I struggled with class. Yeah, there you go. Struggled with class, struggled with school. <clears throat> um, things didn't make sense. I was socially awkward and, um, and I, you know, and I think most schools are, are, have this issue is that, you know, look, kids are evil sometimes. And, you know, it, it, my school in particular was very clicky and I didn't really fit into a group. I'm, I'm, or I've either life has shaped me this way, or this is how I was born. I don't know, but very independent, but life has demanded that of me. So I've learned to, I've never really had a consistent group of friends. This is very coming and going. Um, so I got very comfortable being an individual all the time. And their days, some days were better than others, but um, little Brenda really struggled with that a lot growing up. And having a father who is in the public spotlight uh, in a small town, he was a hospital administrator for 23 years and he grew this hospital from, I mean, I remember as a kid, he took me to work one time and we had to step over the bums sleeping in the doorway, the homeless sleeping in the doorway just to get into the hospital. And he took it and he completely revamped it, uh, grew it, added onto it, massive campus and, you know, small town, things don't change isn't always welcomed. And so when I was a kid growing up, I sometimes would have teachers that would kind of take out their opinion on me and nobody really helped me figure out why I was the way I was. And I was third grade. My, my main name is Lundquist. And so um, when I was in third grade, <laughs> my teacher finally pulled me aside and she was my favorite teacher ever. And she said, why are you signing your name like that? And I go, what do you mean? I said, what are you talking about? So she handed out, she showed me my times tables. Like we did the timed times tables. And at the top of six of them, I wrote Brunquist. I actually mushed my name together into one name. And that was the first written sign that something was up, but nobody ever did anything to figure it out. So knowing that something's off, knowing you're socially awkward, knowing that people have some form of angst against your father and like nobody really wants to hang with you because they're not looking at you for you it's lonely. I mean, it is terrible. And, uh, you know, and it, I just, I got through it, but it took a long time to get to who I am today and with a lot of confidence. And, and it's also taken me a long time to be able to go back to my hometown, walk into my hometown without wanting to flip everybody the bird <laughs> and tell them to go pound sand and, you know, give them a what for and whatnot. I can literally walk in and just look at everybody and and see the good things that they are today as an adult, because, you know, they were kids back then, just like I was, you know. It's always interesting, isn't it? You know, the, how the journey people go through, but is there a certain, it was a certain people or a different age group that you did get on with, or was it just sort of almost <laughs> I, the world versus you type thing? No, I always got along better with adults because adults didn't judge me like kids did, you know? Adults actually talk to me. And so I always got along better with people who were older and 
because of what I went through, I was way more mature. I mean, you know, my folks could have left me at home at the age of 12 for a weekend and I would have been fine. I never would have caused a problem. I never, I wouldn't have burnt down the house. You know, we wouldn't have had wild parties or anything like that. Uh, you know, I was 14, 15 years old in foreign countries going off on New Year's Eve and, you know, partying with people that I just met and came back fine, you know? Um, and I say party, like I had one glass of wine and that was like a big deal, you know, <laughs> you know? not like today, but, but anyway, but I mean, that was like a big thing. And it's like, there's no way, there's no way in hell I would ever let my kid go in a, for in a, I don't care where we are in the planet. I would never let him go off and, and, you know, do the things that I did because it's a different world now, but those are experiences that I got to have. And you know, my folks always trusted me in that regard. And I never, I never caused any problem. And I never gave them any reason to worry. I mean, at that time, were you running into school or running out of school? What was your direction of travel? At uh, what time? I'm sorry. Well, I mean, were, was school for you? Or was it just a case of get it over and done with it and get out? Oh, quick, I got it. I see what you say. Oh, gosh, school is school is a struggle. School is a real struggle. Um, anything dealing with numbers was terrible. Um, believe it or not, uh, Shakespeare, easy. No, it's because I mix every, I mix everything up now. It just it makes sense to me. You know, I could translate Shakespeare very, very easily. Um, you know, anything that was abstract, I could pull out very easy. So I kind of have this, you, you know, an interesting gift about like I, I see how things are. I see how things work. It's kind of like a very mechanical mindset, but um, it just, I just understand process without really knowing how it's defined. <clears throat> so I can see a pathway to getting to places that some people can't. And I think that's actually what probably got me through school is the fact that I had a mechanical ability, both cognitive and physical, physically, that very few people have at my level. I can take apart anything and put it back together again, not even know how it works. So that's, you know, that's a, that's an interesting gift. So it allows me the ability to, when I work with people, when they're telling me stuff, I can listen to what they're saying. I can break it down and I can break it down into levels to where they now understand it as well as me. And then I can help rebuild whatever it is. So I can do that both and imagery and verbal and mechanical as well. It's kind of interesting. It's interesting as you speak, and I'm just listening to your language, and it, it it's predominantly visual language. There's a little bit of kinesthetic in there, but really sort of quite heavily visual, which I suppose I'm not that surprised at with dyslexia. I, I am dyslexic and ADHD myself, so I get it. Um, you know, but so you, it seems like you can see creativity. You can play it out in your mind. If if you're if you're posed to problems, you can run through the scenario. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. You know those uh, the the kind of assessment tests you get where you know they take a shape of something like a cube and then they unfold it in a certain manner and they say, okay, if you put this together, what would it look like? And I can I can hit that one every single time and not miss it. Just kind of an interesting innate ability that I got. It's strange. I mean, some people's like house plans or or yeah. something. Some people can just literally in their mind superimpose it, and you say it's like, you know, getting buying something from IKEA and just kind of going, I just see it. Or whereas other people go, I have no idea what you're talking. I'm just seeing lines on a page, right? Yeah. It's just just different mindsets. Yeah, it's just I don't know. It's just I've just been that way, and I probably. I noticed it when I was 13. I remember very distinctly when I was in Hawaii, I noticed it specifically because I was fixing all sorts of stuff around the house. And finally, my uncle goes, how the hell do you know how to do all this? I know your dad is working all day. He's not fixing stuff. I go, I don't know. I just know. I just understand this stuff. It was wow. really interesting. Yeah. Wow. And at that time, I mean, what, what, did, what did Brenda want to do when she grew up? What was the original plan way back? <laughs> It wasn't HR. I'll tell you that much. I, you know what? I actually wanted to be an oceanographer and I wanted to actually work with dolphins. I wanted to work with marine life. And in the eighth grade, excuse me, 18, when I was eight, no, I was 17, I was a senior in high school. Um, 
I built my first vision board without actually knowing what it was. And I don't think we even defined what vision boards were back then, but one of the things that, um, you know, our instructor did, we had like a, a life course or something like that. They taught us how to balance a checkbook. They taught us how to write a budget, things that I think kids should know how to do today and, and nobody teaches them how, or at least the school doesn't. And so they said, we, you know, want to, you know, take it, make a collage of what you, what you want your life to be like. And at the time, um, you know, I was heavy into boats. I was working, believe it or not, I was working on engines and on boats and I was, uh, you know, getting new boats prepared for delivery and working on, you know, like, you know, detailing all sorts of, you know, other boats in the marinas in the area. I was hauling them in, hauling them out with one of my best friends and um, getting them ready for winterization because, you know, it's a little cold in Pennsylvania, so you don't want engine blocks to crack. And um, so I actually built this uh, collage of living on the water and actually owning a marina and living right across the street from it. Well, I don't own a marina, but I live across the street from one. And so uh, it's, you know, it's pretty, and I live in it's salt water too. It's not fresh water, just like I had in my collage. So it's, it's pretty neat. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot of what I started out being in existing. That's what I really wanted to do. If you asked me when I was in second grade, I wanted to be Wonder Woman, but, uh, and a police officer. Um, that turned into one woman, but, um, but yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to work with dolphins. I wanted to scuba dive. I wanted, and I wound up actually doing all of that. I was going to say what happened. I mean, it's like, do you, <laughs> do you have a pet dolphin in your back garden? You know, what's going no. on? <laughs> no, um, I spent, actually spent a day, my, one of my former roommates in Hawaii, he and his brother, um, trained dolphins for the Navy. And, and what dolphins do or did, actually, they still use dolphins today, but um, they use dolphins to actually identify where mines are planted on the, on the bottom side of ships because of their, you know, their sonar. <clears throat> so they can retrieve them where they can identify where they are. Um, and then they also used to use sea lions. I don't think they're using them anymore. Um, they may still, but they used to use sea lions to go down and retrieve the, uh, sh uh, the gun shells from the deck because their jaw separates kind of like a horse. And so they're able to wrap their mouth around, you know, a tube that's about like that big. So, and bring them back up again. So I was taken down to, uh, down to the Marine base in Hawaii and uh, got to spend a little time working with dolphins. That was pretty cool. Wow. That's kind of good thing yeah. for the CV, isn't it? It's like, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think for me, the reason why I didn't pursue it is because I had to touch dead fish and I just, <laughs> it was just, that wasn't a job I was prepared to do, but I had to cut it up and blah. Mm. <laughs> you no, had me up to the point of fish and then it was like, it was <laughs> I was done. I'll throw it at them, but I'm not processing it. <laughs> God, I mean, imagine if they process someone else would process it for you. You know, you could be okay. like ma master trainer. Oh, who knows? My assistant. <laughs> Some smells fishy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Love it. So come here. So you, you went through, what did you end up going once you, once you left school, where'd you head to? Well, I actually did the high school or college. Well, into college, I suppose. So I, I took the 20 year route. So when I left high school, I went up, did my freshman year at Franklin Pierce up in Ringe, New Hampshire, <clears throat> and be absolutely beautiful up there. Um, again, socially awkward really struggled making relationships. Um, after about 18 months, I went back to Pennsylvania <clears throat> and uh, just worked for a while. And um, I always wanted to go back to Hawaii. And so I always wanted to go live there permanently. And I did 11 months later, I went back, I went and lived over there, worked in my family's hardware store for a long time. And, uh, you know, started school again. <clears throat> My car got stolen. I worked for Warner Brothers Studio Stores. Um, and I had left the hardware store to go do a different type of retail to learn about, you know, big box retail, big, bigger companies. And my car got stolen. So I had finished all of my schoolwork ahead of time. And they just trashed everything. And so the, my, all of my professors wouldn't let me have an extension or do anything. And 
I couldn't rebuild anything. <clears throat> and so I fired the school. I talked to the dean. He wouldn't do anything. I fired him. I went to the president of the college. He said he couldn't do anything. So I fired him. I mean, I even had a police report in my hand. And so when I told my dad, I said, he said, what did they say? And I said, well, I told him they were fired. And he goes, you did what? <laughs> I said, yeah, I fired the school. And he goes, that's brilliant. <laughs> so uh, I took time off and, you know, that was a huge defeat. That was a real big defeat. And I really didn't even know what I wanted to do. So I just worked and uh, got to a point where I got tired of being on an island in the middle of the Pacific. So I came back to the mainland, <clears throat> worked in the Chicagoland area for about 10 years, uh, pursued a career in retail. And um, it eventually led me to Virginia, where I did not want to be in the cold weather like Wisconsin and Chicago. That's just, it's just too much. I just, I just wasn't happy. So I came down here <clears throat> and um, worked for, uh, at the time, my third Fortune 500 company. And the, I went back to school in 2007 to finish, no, 2005 to finish my degree. And in 2007, finally transferred over to the University of Richmond, got some of the best education I ever had working, uh, going to school over there. And I was working in the HR position at the time. So I had the benefit of actually doing the job and then learning the theology behind it afterwards. And so, you know, I go to school, I'd go to class and we'd start talking about something. It's like, oh, that's why we do that. So it was easy for me to connect the dots. And um, before I came to Virginia is when I learned that I was dyslexic and I actually had to learn how to reread as an adult. So I went from being a CDF failing student all the way to a magna cum laude Latin honors graduate. And then I didn't stop. I went and I got my master's degree. I got my MBA and did a focus in HR strategy. <clears throat> my minor in my bachelor's degree was leadership. So I felt, I felt that that was a really, really good, strong combination to, you know, pull for, uh, for experience and, and really getting that seat at the table. And it absolutely paid off. But the week I was graduating with my bachelor's degree, um, our company announced that they were going through a reduction of force, and I was one of them. And this was in 2009, right when our economy was blowing up. We just just got to 10, you know, 10 percent unemployment, and I was one of the 10 percent. But I was also less than one percent because I saw the writing on the wall. I had already started a network. I had another job in nine days that paid me more, had more responsibility, better better opportunity, and although I didn't like the work. I knew that I had something good. And I told him, I said, I'm giving you two years. That's it. And if I'm not in a position that I want to be in, I'm out. And my friend who actually brought me in, he goes, fair enough. And that's what I did. So two years later, I had an opportunity internally. Uh, that team decided to choose somebody else. It's somebody who had a PhD behind their name <clears throat> and turned out to be a L I A R. And, uh, um, they came at me and said, yeah, we want to reoffer you the position. And it was the same day that I had handed in my resignation, telling him that I had gotten another job, actually doing what I, my dream job. And that was actually going around meeting with clients, helping them figure out their HR problems and traveling. <clears throat> and it was, it was a, it was a fantastic five years. Loved it. I love that your clarity of what you want and, and, I mean, where does that come from? It's just like, is this a, you know, you're a woman on a mission. I'm getting this. I'm getting the MBA. I'm not messing about. You've got your time. Where are you getting this all from? Well, you know, that's the thing. When you spend a lot of time alone, you realize that nobody's coming to do anything for you. You either, you have two choices. You either can stay lost in whatever conversation is in your head or you can find whatever is inside you and go after everything. My, my folks used to tell me, you can, my mom specifically used to say, you can do, you can do and be anything you want to be. The problem with that, and I usually don't talk about my folks, but I will share this, is that even they did this to me. And that was every time I turned and said, I want to do this, 
Like, you know, everybody thought it was great that I wanted to go work with dolphins and I wanted to be an oceanographer. I wanted to be a marine biologist or something, right? Everybody thought it was awesome. I said, great, I want to go to the University of Hawaii. No, you can't do that. Where am I going to go? University of Missouri? I mean, it's in the middle of the country. <laughs> you know, it's like, you, you got to go to do it, you know? And I said, okay, great. How about California? They're like, no. I'm like, well, where am I going to go to, to learn how to do this? And nobody would have an answer, right? Nobody would help me figure that problem out. So I had to figure it out for myself. Um, and I gave up on that, but I, but I enjoyed elements of it. I may not have become a, a marine biologist, obviously, but you know, I took the things that looked really interesting and I became a diver at the age of 14. You know, I was swimming with dolphins more than one occasion and you know, I got to teach people or work with people and teaching them how to scuba dive. I mean, those are fun things to do. You know, I've been to 22 countries in my life. And a lot of them have been scuba diving in, right? You're, you're, you're going to die when I tell you this. Oh my gosh, you're going to laugh when I tell you this. It's actually on my Facebook page. Uh, it'll come up in some of my social for anybody who's listening. Hang on, it'll, it'll pop up. Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead was my dive partner in Kona, Hawaii in 1992 before he died in 91 no it was 90 i moved there in 1990 and uh i had no idea who he was <laughs> but we had the best time diving you know so it, it's like you know when you when you keep going in life you can go in life and have this conversation that you're getting screwed over, that you have no opportunity, that nothing's happening to you, right? The negative side of things. Or you can silence that little pain in the ass. And you can just, every time something comes to you, recognize that it's either a learning opportunity or a blessing. You know, in Jerry Garcia's case, it was both. But, uh, it, you know, you can take those two things and, and everything, even the even the hard, painful stuff, if you can take that on as a learning opportunity, as what are you getting from this? You know, how, where are you accountable and why does it keep happening to you? And you have an opportunity to fix that. You know, don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't do something. If you really want to do it, you go out and do it. You talked about a voice, you know, the, the voice that you hear that almost holds you back. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and listen, I because I sometimes ask people, it's like, do you hear voices? And they're like, no. It's like, do you talk to yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that voice that was sort of almost spurring you on and saying, listen, you want to do it, got to go do it. You know, it's your choice. And mm -hmm. where was that voice coming from? And was it sort of pulling you back or pushing you forward? Uh, for a long time, it pulled me back. And and I refer to it as a narrative. A friend of mine down in Australia, she refers to it as the itty bitty shitty committee, and uh, <laughs> which I love. But it's a narrative, right? That's what it is. We, we all have a narrative of how we see our life and where we see it going. And what we don't realize is that we're the author of that narrative and we can change it anytime we want to. It's hard. It's nothing easy about doing it. You may need to go get a, a clean sheet of paper, change your ribbon, right? <clears throat> Hit delete, delete, delete a few times, but you can change that narrative anytime you want. It's all dependent upon whether you're willing to go through the experience of doing it. Because, and you don't know what that's going to be. It could be an easy narrative to change. It could be a hard one, right? But we all have a narrative. Mm. No, it's, it's very, very true. I mean, is that, is that narrative in your own voice? Or did you hear it in someone else's voice? I, you know, I've never even thought about that. It's in my own voice. It's definitely in my own voice. It's funny, isn't it? Sometimes I know when sometimes when people are telling themselves off or something, they'll use the language that somebody, a parent or a teacher or something used to tell them off. They'll use the, their parents or the, yeah. the other person's language, right? You know, to, to tell yourself off. It's bizarre how we, we do these things. Every time I read something that Tony Robbins writes, I can only hear Tony Robbins in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear anybody else. I can't even hear my own. You know, when you read, you hear your own voice, right? No, when it's Tony Robbins, I actually hear Tony Robbins. And, and there's a couple of, you know, Steve Harvey's and I love Steve Harvey's work. And so when I run into things and I remember things that I hang on to him, you know, that he said, when I run into those things, I actually hear his voice saying them, right? Not mine, somebody else's. So. 
There's something recently it was like, yeah, you couldn't read this without reading it in the voice of Morgan Freeman. <laughs> so <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember what it was. It's right. like, <laughs> Did, did you just did you just read this like Morgan Freeman did? It's like, <laughs> yeah, I did actually. Yeah, <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> it's amazing. It's like having Morgan Freeman in your head narrating. It's like that's kind of cool, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. So, come here. What what drew you to then Hawaii? Was that just a, a great location, or oh you know, no, no? My dad grew up in Hawaii, so. Um, okay. <clears throat> There was a family business over there. Yeah, it's still actually over there. Um, I'm working on a project that actually may wind up taking me back over several times throughout the year, which would be pretty awesome. Um, <clears throat> but I have a goal, and that is to actually buy our family's uh, home that was sold when my grandmother passed away. I want it. It's my favorite place in the whole planet, and that's that's what I want. Time to go and start terrorizing the neighborhood then. <laughs> <laughs> It's just make, <laughs> make them feel a bit unwelcome. <laughs> they are like, oh crap, she's back. <laughs> God, she's older. <laughs> yeah, who's who's sleeping on our driveway? <laughs> yeah. I said when we when we run the film about your life, we'll we'll get Morgan Freeman to just to narrate that bit. <laughs> yeah, Brenda's asleep on the driveway again. You know. She she turns into the neighborhood and all of a sudden you hear Morgan Freeman going, and here she comes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great goal, right? You know, go back to, I mean, is Hawaii, is that, would that be home for you? Is that where you sort of feel most at, at ease? It's the place where I, where my heart calls me the most. Mm. Um, <clears throat> my, my home is here in Virginia and I love it here too, but that Island has called me my entire life. And <clears throat> even though I can't talk about this project, it's a it, until it comes to fruition it's an awesome project that gives me a chance to give back and i the more i realize um my whole life i is that island has called me and um now i know why and i think i know why right i think it's because it's gotten me to this point where i can now give back to you know the community that's over there a particular community but and I can do it from here, which would be pretty awesome. Are you a water person? Very much so. Okay. I'm an absolute water sun baby. I People ask me if I ski. I'm like, nope, I roll down the hill. Uh, <clears throat> I am not a cold weather good at all whatsoever. But I also can't stay in paradise for a long period of time anywhere because, you know, I grew up with the change of seasons. My whole life has changed the seasons. So yeah. I just have, I just like all. <laughs> I like it all so no it's cool I mean it's 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 funny isn't it I mean and is your preference to be walking along water's edge on the water right in the water what's your preference because humans for some we're really attracted to water right you know and yeah. some people people tend to vary and it's it's always interesting in where people are out in their journey some people like full immersion some people I don't know it's kind of weird right yeah yeah it is and it's not the immersion piece that that gets me it's just i don't know the energy that the vibe that i get from it mm -hmm. no it's awesome awesome so you eventually you sort of found the hr world and then sort of rocketed up there fairly quickly and yeah. does that does that just does that feel like home for you is it is a, yeah it is and i i've gotten to the point where I don't want to own the HR problem anymore. Um, the thing that I, you know, everybody's got gifts and if you hone in and honor your gifts and, and really engage in what you're good at, you're going to be happy, right? Because you're utilizing something that's innate to you. <clears throat> and because I have this ability where I can see how things fit together or don't fit together and, and how to build and break stuff down, I, I think I'm actually much better as somebody who can sit there and tell somebody, okay, so I see and hear you said, if I understand you correctly, here's your problem. Yeah. Okay, great. Wonderful. Now let's start looking at how you can overcome this. Here are, you know, a couple of different options. You know, here's your, here's your line in the sand that you can't cross or otherwise it's going to be unlawful or whatever. And, you know, we got to figure out how close to that line you really want to get. <clears throat> and still be in the good graces of the law but at the same time 
you know, how conservative do you want to be? Like how you want to be risk adverse or are you, you know, really wanting to ride that line and take a chance and the decision is yours. It's your business. But, and so I get a chance to help them figure those things out. I also get to help people figure out how to actually do this and how to actually become HR people and teach them all the things that they need to know, both in the small business, mid-sized business and, um, government contracting realm. So that helps out a lot. And, and, you know, that part's fun for me, you know, it gives me a living, but man, it's, it, you just feel good walking away knowing that you're a problem solver. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny, right? Cause the, you know, the mix up there, you know, saying before you weren't, you know, almost, I think you described yourself a bit of a loner, you know, and as that sort of just couldn't mix in mm -hmm. and now you're in HR. Yeah. <laughs> so, Managing people is it, I, is that is that coming down a bit of a control thing or is it just is that <laughs> I don't know I think for a while it was um, because before I learned how to be a good leader I mean I think I was innately a leader but I had attachments to what people were doing and I would be very judgmental in my earlier days very 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 judgmental and really I mean it's like people know when I'm not crazy about what they do, it apparently just radiates off me or they see it in my face or something. It's just like people, everybody that tells me, I said, this is the one thing about you. We always know where we stand with you. And I'm like, I don't even say anything. They're like, you don't have to. <laughs> so I get it. Listen, I have a resting bitch face, so that's fine. I get it. You know, it's like people go, are you in a really bad mood? It's like, no, I'm, I'm good. Thanks. It's like, Tell your face, right? You know? Yeah. Well, I, you know what, to be honest with you, I was, I was really, really hard. I was really, really hard to get along with. And, you know, some of that was the bitterness of growing up alone. And some of that was the bitterness of the judgment that I used to face. And, you know, I got into a position where I thought, because I didn't have a mentor, I didn't have, you know, I had mentors at every stage of my career when I got serious, but I didn't have good leaders before I was 30 years old, I had people that, you know, I grew up in a, I'm a, I'm a gen, I'm a gen Xer, right? We grew up with, if you don't like the job, there's the door and it hit you in the ass on the way out. But as I was, you know, I had to overcome all of that edge. And it started with my, with Tom and Tom was one of my best bosses ever. And, and he recognized it. He's like, girl, he says, you are strong, but you are a diamond in the rough and you have some pretty serious hard edges. And I was so grateful, even though it sucked to hear it, I was so grateful that he actually acknowledged that I had capability because nobody in my life had ever done so up until that point in time. Nobody other than my mother. Your mother is always going to be your cheerleader for the most part, right? You're, as far as your mother could do, you can make the best mud pies ever. Nobody can beat you. But nobody acknowledged the fact that I had capability until I was 30 years old. Everybody kept saying that I had potential. Potential is very different than capability. Nobody told me what I was good at, even though I knew I could do things, but I was never encouraged to really hone in on capability and improve on it and master it and use it to your advantage, right? So he mm. was the first one and he was very supportive, very, very supportive. I mean, every now and again, I'd get a hard lesson from him, but I was okay with that. I mean, it stunk. I didn't like... I didn't like it when, you know, my ego tr got trumped, but again, I recognized everything he I was going through was for the benefit of my learning. I just had to figure out through my own filters is how I saw life, what those lessons were and how to apply it. And it's, it's much easier when you get older to do that. And you've, you've been better at practicing it than when you're starting to figure out because you still believe nobody likes you when you're going through it, but that's not the case. They're actually, they're actually helping you. And you just mm. have to find it in you to remember that that's actually what it is. Mm. And that's not easy. That's not easy at all. That you eat a lot of crow. <laughs> you eat a lot of crow in that process. There's no doubt. Do you like you? Do you love you? Do I love me? I love me now. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I say that without thinking twice. Do I love the person I was back then? I love the person who I was back then. It, at the point I am in life, because had I not gone through that, I wouldn't be who I am now. I didn't love myself back then 
because I didn't know who I was. I didn't have my own trust, faith, and confidence in my abilities. I felt like I was trying to get anybody to listen to what I could do. And then I was buried with this whole life of like, there's something wrong with me and everybody sees it, but damn it, nobody's willing to help me. You know, nobody's coming to help me. No one. So those are some battles. That's harsh, right? It was very harsh. Hmm. Yeah. And now, I mean, are you where you're supposed to be now, do you believe? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I am. I really, really am. I, I have no doubt in my mind. I'm, I'm doing exactly. I refer to God as the chairman of the board. Uh, I'm, I'm doing exactly what the big boss wants me to do. And I feel very comfortable saying that, too. But it's funny because. You know, just the quick thought that came through my head. Um, I had gotten some feedback the other day about how somebody told me, it's like, you just, you're so stoic when it comes to dealing with crisis. And I'm like, well, I don't know if I'm stoic. I just, I don't quite react to it the way most people do. It's like, cause I know there's an answer, you know, crisis is just another, it's just an elevated problem with emotion attached to it <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. And it's not that I'm emotionless, I'm not, but it's just, I, I don't necessarily, I don't get stuck in the problem, you know, because I've dealt with so much of it. It's just like some problems are very easy to solve. Some are complex, but none of them, very few of them are worth getting your blood pressure up and over because there's always an answer. You may not like it, but there's always an answer. There's something workable. So I'm kind of wondering here is, I mean, is there a tie back to the dyslexia there almost that because you can almost role play this out visually, you can see it unfold and things like that, that you kind of go, guys, there's no point. Yeah. Whatever, you know, someone's, whatever's happened has happened. So you can run through the scenarios in your own head, whereas everyone's just running around panicking, going, ah, you know, it's like. <laughs> there could, there could very well be. I mean, I wouldn't be hmm. surprised if, if. You know, some of you peel back my skull and look and say, oh, hey, look, those two wires connect. You know, I wouldn't be surprised at all. And yeah, right. Exactly. Just they just turn her battery off. Like, you don't want to zap her. <laughs> we don't want to get zapped. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a correlation to that whatsoever. But I because of the level of judgment that I underwent when I was a lot younger, when I was, when I realized that I had done something that wasn't correct or I was responsible or I made a mistake or something like that internally and very quietly. And I tried to do my best to hide it. I was in absolute panic and the panic wasn't so much whether I was right or wrong, or it was, I just did something to impact somebody else in a bad way. And what are people going to think about me? And that comes, I know that that comes from the social awkwardness of early on in life and not having a lot of friends because the only story you can get in your head is I must have done something. And now people don't think very highly of me, right? So that's where that came from. And I did wind up, I figured that one out. And that one is that one is put to bed. I mean, it sounds almost like there was like too much responsibility too soon. You know, it's like not allowed to evolve naturally. It's kind of going, here's the keys. <laughs> don't don't wreck the place. Look after yourself. Best of luck. It was definitely look after yourself my whole life. Yeah. Um you know, like I said, I don't really talk much about my folks, but my parent, my father was a CEO and my mother was a CEO wife. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of life guidance growing up. So I had to figure it out. And what worked for them didn't necessarily work for me. Hmm. And so it was always, and, and that's over the last couple of years, I've gotten real clear on is that, you know, I love my folks and, and they did the best that they could under their circumstances and with their capabilities but I'm very much a different person. And so the guidance that I would get from them really didn't work for me. You know, I just kept failing and failing and failing and failing in personal relationships. And because they didn't know I had this disability, they, you know, 
like I said, they only did the best that they could. So that comes with maturity and a lot of for you know, a lot of a lot of time thinking on the hammock by yourself. And um, but then I realized that there isn't anything wrong with me. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a good person. Uh, I don't cheat, steal, or take things away from people that I shouldn't. Matter of fact, I do everything I can to put back into the world. So at some point. I had to let go what I thought was wrong and realize that what, what, what was in the conversation, what I thought was wrong with me were actually gifts. And so I started pulling those out. And then that's how I got to change my narrative around is I just focused in on my gifts. So I started focusing in on what I did well. And then I would acknowledge it to myself because when you're alone, you're the only person <laughs> that's going to matter. So, you know, I, I found myself not being so concerned with everybody thinks about me. I, mm. you know, I started to find myself being very comfortable with making a decision. And if somebody didn't like it, realize that, well, you don't have to live with that consequence. So why are you getting your knickers in a wad? <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like, why are you getting so upset over something that you will never experience? Right. And, um, and it took a while. And I realized that probably the, the biggest battle that I had was having low self-esteem and being surrounded by a lot of narcissists. Mm, yeah. Narcissist in your life is always fun. It's always a, it's an interesting one. Yeah. Interesting. Would you, you know, you're talking about the dyslexia there. Did, did a lot of stuff unfold when you eventually sort of got that diagnosis or got to that point is, was that it sounds like that was almost the start of a, a whole new journey for you is that is that a fair observation it was it was and the first thing that happened was a sigh of relief that mm. it, i wasn't i wasn't broken i just needed a different way of doing things you know i mean i really thought i was i was that i was broken and i had no warranty right but i just needed i just needed to find a different way and once I found a different way and I realized that, holy crap, I can get an A in what I'm studying and I can do these things. And what I'm, when I, and I feel good about the work that I'm producing, that's when I had to, I actually had to forgive myself for feeling so bad for so many years. And once I did that, I just took off. I mean, you want to know where the fire in the belly was? It, it happened shortly after that diagnosis because I knew I could do more. I knew I could be more, but I was frustrated between people not being there, not helping me out, not helping me figure out what this is, not getting any support, not even from my own ex-husband. And, um, you know, people tell me, well, you don't need to be going to college. And I'm like, I, I do not want to work a $6 hour job for the rest of my life. That's not what I want for myself. You know, I don't want to be, you know, lifestyles of the rich and famous either, but man, I want something better. I don't want to constantly struggle and live paycheck to paycheck and live a lifestyle of $6 an hour, you know? And, um, and that, and that really is when I made that determination um, and I was able to get past the reading problem and the comprehension problem that's when I realized that I have a whole world in front of me that I haven't, I didn't think was possible and it's here. And mm -hmm. I just went after it and it was hard. <clears throat> it was rewarding. You know, there's some blood, sweat and tears in there. There was setbacks. There was a lot of victories that came with it too. Probably more victories than setbacks at that point where mm -hmm. before it was always setbacks and very few victories. So it changed the paradigm changed. Isn't it funny? It's almost like a bottled up hunger. You know, as you say, it's just like, you know, for years you've got two and two equals seven and you bang your head off the wall, you go crazy, you do this. And eventually that piece slots in and suddenly you kind of go on, I need to devour every book, listen to audio, attend this, get a mentor for this, that, and the other. And it's like, what's the hurry? It's like, I'm making up for life. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'm doing things now that I was dreaming about doing when I was 30 years old, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> it's, you know, 20 years, but I, who cares? I'm doing it, right? I'm doing it now. And I'm doing it in a time in life where I can appreciate it more and, and really, really get the benefit, the full benefit of it, because I have life experience. I have knowledge. Um, I've got, if 
financial capabilities to do some of the things that I want to do. And I, those things just don't happen when you're 30. You may have some of those things, but you don't have them quite at the level that you really want. The benefit of the listeners. Shoe. He's happy. <laughs> Brenda has a pet horse in the background. <laughs> I have a nine and a half month old Great Pyrenees and he has an old shoe right now and, and he needs probably needs to go out. So he's distracted. <laughs> he's he's currently trying to put your shoes on so he can go out himself. Like, you know? it's like, it's and like, if, you, if you don't put them on, I'm going to eat it. <laughs> so Yeah, it's like, mm, boy, up. Yeah. It's like, uh, no, he's huge. Beautiful, beautiful dog. You. Lovely, lovely white coat. So um, no, it's and tell me this, would, would you classify yourself as quite intuitive when you're sort of working with people? And, you know, it's that because I kind of find people who have, you know, sometimes your weakness can become your strength or you yeah. get a weakness in one part actually gives you a super strength in other parts. Does that make sense for you at all? Yes. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. Being intuitive is part of this. And that's a huge strength of mine. Um, observation is another one. I've been a complete, I have been probably one of the most observant people that you'll, you'll know. My, my folks said that when, even when I was just a baby, like you were always watching and paying attention to everything that was in front of you. You know, I, I do, you know, daydream and drift off like anybody else, but situational awareness is definitely something that is one of my strengths. And so I think that plays to my favor in the field of human resources, because, you know, the human game is something that I can play really well because I had to use it as a defense mechanism and a survival tactic when I was much younger. So I know, I know what people do. I know, you know, what I can see when I can see it when it's going through their minds. Right. And I'll call them out on it. And they're like, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. how do you know that? And I'm like, dude, if I can only do this with lottery numbers, but I can't, I can do it with the people, but I cannot do with lottery numbers. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that has definitely helped me out over the years, for sure. Being able to read an individual and, and having that empathy, that empathic ability, right? You can just feel what's going on. And I walk into a room and I can tell when it's off and I can walk into a room and I can tell when it's on. And, you know, if it's off, then okay, then I know I got work to do. And if it's on, hey, we're having fun. We're going to we're going to play today. We're going to have, have the best time ever it's great isn't it i mean that that sort of and i think we don't necessarily lean into that part enough you know people shake it off and just going yeah just something weird so let's get on with business and it's like going no let's 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 listen to this i mean do you are you good at listening to yourself um to a degree um you know where my ego kicks in is i don't like I don't like, I don't, I don't, first off, I don't like making mistakes <clears throat> and it's not because I'm afraid to make them. I'm not, <laughs> this guy's got my sleeve. Let me go. <laughs> it's not that I, oh my gosh. Come on, dude. <laughs> Brenda's, Brenda's actually about <laughs> to get go. Thank you. <laughs> oh my word. I, I don't like making mistakes. Um, not because it feels uncomfortable to be wrong, but it's because <laughs> yeah i have a dog on my shoulder um <laughs> for those I, not watching it's like no, we, know, <laughs> we, we need a second second microphone here the dog is joined. <laughs> yeah this is definitely an indicator that he has to go outside <laughs> and he jumps up i mean he jumps up on me and he starts putting my arm in his mouth it's time to go out but like, you're gonna have to wait yeah. you're gonna have to wait a minute so i'm not i'm i'm on the phone Anyway, um, I, I don't like making mistakes because it means that I've potentially negatively impacted somebody else. And, and that's mm. really hard for me to live with. You know, I, mm. I, I didn't get somebody's pay in and, you know, what happens if, you know, they needed that money or something, you know, it impacts somebody else. I don't, I don't like that. Um, I don't like being caught. I don't like being called out harshly because like most people, you don't know you made a mistake. And so when people, that's why, that's why I teach leaders. It's like, you got to get right with how you feel before you approach this, because you approach a good person with a, with a rotten attitude, you're going to lose that trust immediately. And I'm one of those people. It's like, you come after me because everything I do, I do with the best of intentions. I never do anything with militia, you know, maliciously or, 
you know, with the forethought that I'm going to hurt somebody or teach somebody a lesson or rah, rah, right. Even when, even in my younger years, it was the same thing. You know, I may have been bitter about some things, but I never would do anything intentionally to hurt anyone. So when you come after me and you're sharp and you're bitey and you're accusatory and you haven't yet told me what's really going on, I, trust is gone automatically. I will never trust you again. How, how can I trust you when you're being that judgmental? And mm -hmm. I've never, I've never done that to you. Right. So. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sort of, um, I mean, that's out of interest. I mean, do you ever sort of really get to say what you want to say? Or, I mean, are, are you always having to, to monitor and manage your language and, and your <laughs> feedback? There are times you have to know when to say it, how to say it, and you have to know when not to say it. And there's a time and a place for everything. Um, there's a person in my life that I speak to that gets very offended very easily and absolutely doesn't believe that she is wrong. And when she's in the heat of the moment, even though she is wrong and it's impacting you, you can't tell her that. Otherwise, she'll never listen. But when you choose a time in the future where she's in a listening capacity and you start talking about that, then you can start saying, yeah, no, you do do that. And remember when we had this incident? Like, yeah. And then she'll go, yeah, I kind of did do that. Then I'm like, yeah, you did. So, um, so it's a time and a place for everything. And, you know, sometimes you do have to play the political game, which I don't like playing, but sometimes self-preservation is everything, but I try and be very honest, openly every minute I possibly can. You know, and that's not to say I don't lie or anything, but yeah, there are times where I do hold back. I think there's some, and there's sometimes people just have to learn lessons for themselves. I mean, fundamentally, do you think people are generally good and honest people or are they just a little bit sidetracked or what's your... I think for the most part, people are genuinely good their insecurities actually are what pops up or there are people that do have a lack of values or they don't have the same values and as high as my values. Right. So I think inherently people are good for the most part. Um, I, I think that depending on the subject, it could probably drop down to 50, 50 because it, it, because I think that's a fair statement to make too, because you may not believe in everybody doing things good all the time, but you know, again, I work, I, you know, I'm in HR. I, I see what's going on all the time. I see what's happening. And I see when people do things that are out of character and out of value and out of integrity. And that just comes with the job. So I tend to see that probably a little bit more. Anybody who's in this position would see it more than more than normal. Because I was saying you get a, I'm sure you get a bit of a, a magnified view of life right because you kind of you get to see the good and the really bad you know it's not joe yeah. joe blogs and his job doesn't see this stuff day yep. to day but you get to see the you know the headlines and the, yep. the, the, the stuff that doesn't go out too right and we're playing the people game i mean that's what we do we mm. play the people game and playing the people game means that you have to know when somebody's being dishonest and when they're not or when they are maybe not being dishonest but when they're out of integrity yeah and that's an easier, I think that's an easier pill to swallow. Not everybody's honest, just some people don't want to get caught. And so they may not necessarily lie, but they don't always tell the truth either. So <laughs> yeah, honest, not lying. Yeah, it's all it's a, it's a yeah. bit of a it's a bit of a weird one. You mentioned values there. What what would be your core values? Well, my core values is integrity first and foremost. Because that's the one thing you own outright. You can lose everything in life and your integrity your word is is the only thing that you have and and if you and if you against your word you're actually going against yourself and so why would you why would you do that um you know i grew up um i grew up in the lutheran faith i don't call myself anything really beyond i just say that i'm a i'm a big believer and i'm i'm in i'm a faithful person um but i grew up reading a lot the story of the good samaritan and, and that's how i've lived my life is from that parable is mm. the parable of the good samaritan mm. and um you know a samaritan back in biblical times was actually the lowest form of human possible and so here i was as a you know i look back and as, when i realized that that 
I'd never heard that growing up. But when I looked at, I, I discovered, I listened to it in a sermon one time, and they said that, yeah, you know, Samaritans were the worst form of life. They were actually, you know, below an Egyptian slave at the time and even ranked and viewed lower than, you know, livestock. And so, uh, you know, like I said, I grew up my whole life, you know, believing in that and then, you know, kind of taking that step back and looking at myself through that, that lens again as a kid where you didn't feel like mm. you were anything, that you were at that same level, but yet you were still operating with kindness and a giving heart and taking care of people and doing what's right, just even as a kid, you know, kind of, it kind of hit me. And that's, that's the big reason why when you asked me earlier, do you believe you're doing what you're supposed to be doing in life? And, and that's where it comes from. Yeah, it's, it's, it is so having that, having that play. I mean, would you classify religious, spiritual, where, where do you set yourself in the whole thing? Oh, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm absolutely a believer. And my job is just to go out and, and do good and be the best person I possibly can to everybody else. And there are days I'm good at it, days I'm not so good at it. And, um, you know, there are days where I need, I need the same thing paid back to me, but if it doesn't come, you know, we know how to deal with that. <laughs> yeah. We deal with it a lot in life, but. Is that, uh, would you classify that as your life purpose? Is that a. He got in. Um, my life purpose. I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could define my life purpose. I don't know if I've hit that yet. I know that I'm, I know I'm doing the things I'm supposed to be doing, hmm. but I don't know if I've fully realized my life purpose yet. Yeah. I think there's one more thing left for me that I don't have and to realize my life purpose. And I think, I think I'm getting closer to it, but I'm not there yet, hmm. but I think it's coming soon. I love that when you, it's, that's like intuition and belief and everything else. All, I mean, like there's a phase I get it. Cause there's a phase in my life at the moment is kind of like, I've kind of got like 60% of the facts and I was kind of, I need to rest the facts for it all to make sense, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's like until you get the full understanding of what you're actually trying to do. So yeah, it's, um, I get it. I really do. Yeah. Tell me this, what are you, what are you great at and what are you terrible at? <laughs> we'll start with what I'm terrible at. Um, I'm terrible at, I am terrible at math. <laughs> My threes, my sixes, and my eights all look the same. So anytime I do anything with numbers, I have to get, I have to I have to verify my work. I have to if I work alone like I do most of the time, I step back from my equations and I come back to it, and then I'll see if I made a mistake or I use a spreadsheet or something like that. Um, the things that I'm really bad at, things that I'm not great at, um, yeah, math is probably the biggest one that I can think of. Um, I'm not a good liar. I was great at it when I was a kid, but I am not as an adult. I really, I'm not a good liar at all. Um, <clears throat> I can't, I, I really can't be dishonest. It just, it, it grates against me. Um, believe it or not, up until a little while ago, um, I really wasn't, it's not that I wasn't good at it, but I didn't really... I didn't really give a lot of consideration to my own financial welfare. I could manage anybody else's money and their funds, companies to, to the penny and felt really good about it. But oddly enough, when I looked and did it for myself, it was just like, ah, whatever. Cause I thought it was like, well, the only one I'm impacting is me. And then I finally, sorry, he's barking now. Um, but the only, it's not silent. Um, the only one that I, you know, when I realized that I, when I heard it in my head one time, I'm like, I am hurting myself. What the hell am I doing? So, you know, I got, I developed a new relationship with money that has done a lot better. Um, mm. But yeah, it's just, you know, I never looked at it that way. I was like, well, mm. I'm not hurting anybody else. Well, you're not doing yourself any favors there, kid, either. So um, I can't wolf whistle. <laughs> I want to learn how to do that so dang on bad. And I've tried, 
you just spit all over yourself, right? And just cannot whistle like that. That's something I always wanted to do. It's easy, right? <laughs> oh yeah, sure. For some people. <laughs> Oh, it's uh, it's amazing. So, what are you great at then? You've hit me with the stuff that you're not good at, or you're terrible at. What's the greatness coming? Oh, the greatness. Um, hmm. Well, let's phrase it a different way. When should we get you in the room, and when should we get you out of the room? <laughs> <laughs> you get me out of the room when somebody has stroked my feathers the wrong way. Um, <laughs> that's a good time to just let me go. Let me go do what I need to do. Because I will pull a Dixie Carter on somebody. I will. I will sound <laughs> like uh, one of the characters from uh, the old '80s TV show, uh, Julia Sugarbaker from Designing Women. Um, so we don't do that. But um, to get me into the room, <clears throat> get me into the room when you've got somebody who's not sure about themselves, and we'll sit and talk and we'll break that down. But it's got to be an individual who wants to do the work and is not afraid to get dirty and to be uncomfortable with being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, then we can really make some magic happen. But um, yeah, I think that's a, you know, just I am a very loyal person and I have very amazing friends, the people who are equally loyal and um and I it just, I, I finally let go of the people in my life who are not at that spot. So I would definitely say um, finding the right people in life now and attaching the loyalty appropriately. I think that's, that's a pretty good way of, of looking at that, that I, that I do pretty good now compared to what I used to. I'm a pretty good judge of character. I suppose and I, like I can a... see when you are one and when you aren't. <laughs> that's it. And it's, it's almost like a you know it's coming across almost like a bit of a self-protection thing as well you gotta you gotta assess the you know sort of read the crowd yep <clears throat> yeah what do you love to do what do i love to do god i love going out hiking i love i love spending time with the people that i really really truly care about um i love spending quality time and um i love sitting around a campfire or a fire and just having great conversation <clears throat> with or without a cocktail. Um, I love just getting lost. I love traveling. I love flying. Oh my God. I love flying. I love the whole experience. I, it, this is, oh gosh, I'm going to so geek out here in a second. When I fly and I'm about ready to fly again, <clears throat> I literally enjoy going online finding the times, identifying the aircraft that I want to fly on, looking at the seats, right? You know, figuring out what seat I want to sit in, the the anticipation of the destination, waking up early, got off early, getting to the airport early, just the whole process, being on the aircraft, relaxing, landing and being somewhere else that I normally am not in. I absolutely love the whole process. And I love the theory of flying. I wanted to fly for the Navy. And I couldn't because I had cracked the lenses, I had cracked the vision. And so I just, it, to me, it's just amazing how something like that can stay in the air. You know, I just think, I think they're just incredible. So I get a kick out of being on aircraft. I take it you're not one for sleeping then in the middle of it? Oh, no, I'll sleep in it, but I enjoy being, <laughs> there's no doubt. I will take a nap, uh, especially if it's long flights. I have no problems taking, I have no problems falling asleep in an aircraft, but I just enjoy the whole thing, just everything, mm. the smell, the experience, the landing, the takeoff, the turbulence doesn't bother me at all. I just love the experience of flying. Wow. Yeah, it's great. It's, it is that, as you say, it's the, it's, it's like a, it is, it's, it's an adventure, right? You totally. know, you're going off to a whole new place. Yeah. And I can sit, I sit and watch the aircraft take off all day and you know, it's just kind of like, God, where are they going? You know, where are they going? Because in just a few short hours, they're in a new environment, a new ecosystem, surrounded by different people, you know, different culture, different. I mean, we have subcultures here in the U.S. They could be eating Mexican, like real Mexican food <laughs> versus, you know, cheap Mexican food that you find somewhere else. Right. I mean, it's it just it's yeah, it's just the, the thrill of it. And then you're meeting new people and you're you're you know, for me, it's transacting business in different places and. No, that's awesome. Are you a chatter? Do you get chatting to the person next to you? 
Um, depends. Depends on what mood I'm in. It, de- it totally depends. If somebody strikes up a conversation with me, like a good one, then yes, absolutely. If I get that funky vibe, I go to sleep. Or I'll, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or I'll put my earbuds on and be like, protect. I just, there's some people that I don't gel with and it's just kind of like, okay, that's really sweet and that's nice. And you just stay over there. And, uh, but most of the time, <laughs> most of the time I talk to people, the ones that relay deep personal things about themselves too quickly, just, you just sit on that side over there. There's, you just, that's a whole bag. That's like Satan in the Sunday hat. <laughs> it's just, you stay over there. <laughs> you're, there's something about you that's just not feeling right so yeah just too much too soon it's like yeah yes. we we... <laughs> yeah there's that's just trouble coming at you yeah <laughs> <laughs> tell us i mean heroes and inspirational people in your life is there anyone that stands out for you inspirational people mm. oh yeah um steve harvey's one of them steve harvey's story is pretty amazing um he, you know, this is a guy who had a massive stuttering problem. And he, and if you, if you look him up, he, this is one story that he tells actually quite regularly. Um, he had a massive stuttering problem in school. He got up on in front of the class. He got picked on by his teacher, which I understand what that feels like. And his teacher said, what do you want to be? And he thought he was going to give the most brilliant answer ever. So, you know, people are going up and like, I want to be a doctor and I want to be a, you know, police officer and I want to be a fireman, right? You know, the standard stuff that kids do. He gets up and he stands up for the whole crowd. Everybody was at the end. He was the only one that went up front. And when he tells a story, he thought he was going to get a gold star. And I can completely relate to this. And he says, I want to be on TV. And his teacher said, who do you think you are thinking that you can be on TV? And just totally beat him down for it. And it was his dad that told him, He's like, look, you write down whatever your teacher wants on this piece of paper and you give it to her. He said, but I want you to take your piece of paper and put it in your drawer and I want you to look at it every day. And every Christmas until she died, he sent her a brand new TV every year. He did not want to miss. He did not want her to miss the fact that he was on TV, seven different shows and a pod, you know, and just, you know, that's, that's to me is winning, you know? So he's a, he's a big inspiration because again, that story, I totally get that. You know, I had teachers that told me I couldn't make it in this world and here I am. It's the influence that people have on, on us at that young age. It's phenomenal, right? You know, it's Mm -hmm. teachers, parents, next door neighbors, whoever, I mean, going back, you know, to your, you know, mini Brenda, you know, what, what would you be saying to her right now? You know, I think some people would say, you know, fix her mindset. She, so she doesn't go through the same pain. I would say, go through the experience. You're, you're, this is, this is what you're bound for. This is what the world is requiring of you to do, but give her a different way of handling it. Um, don't cheat her of the experience because I like who she's become, but I wish, I wish that I had better guidance on how to deal with it. And who knows, you know, I don't know what I would have been like had I had better guidance. I don't know what I would have been like. I don't know how, like I would have turned out if I had more courage to stand up and say, I think you're full of it or no, you're wrong. That's not true. Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. But I do know that I had to go through all that to be who I am today Mm -hmm. and to do the things that I want to do and, and, and create my definition of what I think is success for me. What is that definition? Doing exactly what I'm doing right now. I've got my home by the water. I've got, you know, I can go to bed at night and sleep and not worry that I'm not going to be able to pay my bills, even though I don't make, you know, I'm, I'm not going out and ordering an 80 foot yacht every week, but, um, I'm, I do well. I mean, I do okay. You know, I'm, I'm no different than anybody else. I have the same concerns about money as everybody else does, but, you know, I can, I, I, I feel like I'm winning the game of money. 
And once you win the game of money, <clears throat> meaning that you're stable, um, even though you don't make quite what you want, you're okay with it, you know, because you know, you're going to be fine. I can lose a customer tomorrow and that may be my bread and butter customer. And I know I'm going to be fine. I just know it, you know, because I know what needs to be done. I know how to get out and hustle and shake and move. And it may not be one customer that I find, maybe three that equates to that same dollar amount, but I'll do it just because I got that confidence. It'll be hard, but I know I can do it. Are you, do you perform at your best in a crisis? Is that, is that your sweet spot? Probably. When I'm problem solving, that's probably when I'm at my best. Mm, mm. I don't think I've ever really looked at it that way, but that may very well be the case. Yeah. Mm. And tell me this. I mean, talk to me. What are you capable of? Do you know? Do you have any concept of that? <laughs> no, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. And, and to me, it's beautiful, just, right? Yeah, it is. But I, to me, it's, I like figuring it out every day. Can I do this? Can I not do this? You know, you're like, what comes at me today? And there are days where the pressure is hard and heavy and, and that's great. But I'm, you know, the sun went down and I woke up the next morning. Okay. We'll do it all over again. Thank God. I don't have to repeat yesterday. And then the days it's like, shoot, shoot. I wish I could repeat yesterday. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Well, that's the thing as well with dyslexia or any sort of learning ability, because we tend to get a lower on uh, some for myself, I would be under average for reading and writing, but for intu intuition, creativity and something else, which I can never remember, I would be above average, which actually pulls my IQ up. But it's interesting how, you know, it, it sort of, um, it, it just brings you into a very different space, you know, and how you can, um, be good at that you pick up different things and, and you just you just learn more does that make sense yeah totally completely learn more when mm. you when you drop what you think you know and you're open to anything and everything your eyes are widened your aperture opens up you may not always like it you may not like what you find in the process and you may not like what you see in the mirror but you're open. <clears throat> and I would much rather be open now than closed. Cause I understand I, there's a benefit to being closed, but there's also a cost. And I think the cost is much higher than the benefit. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's that's, as you say, I love that comparison between capability and potential, you know, so it's, you're capable of this, but actually, you know, are you fulfilling your potential and what are you doing about it? Well, potential is an empty word. It doesn't have a destination like hope, right? I think mm. hope is one of the most dangerous words in the English language. Hope is a place where you are wanting an outcome and you come from a place of fear. And I think hope restricts. Now, when you apply hope to, let's say, somebody who's got a terminal illness or could be potentially diagnosed with a terminal illness, I don't view hope in the same manner. I mean, I think that's natural and that's human, but I think people use hope um, in the wrong way. And I don't think when they use hope, they're not calling their future into existence. They're not calling something to existence because they're coming from a place of fear and hoping that it happens on its own. And it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't. Yeah, you take the law of attraction, law of vibration, take whatever else, and you know you sort of go, well, well, let's just hope for it, and it's like going, yeah, good luck with that one. Yeah, even <laughs> if even if just saying it changes your your brain chemistry, mm. because you know the definition of it, you know the intention behind it. Mm. But if you if you come from a place and it's not like I hope to do something, it's like I'm going to do this. You know, yeah. I'm going to get that family house. I don't want to hope for it. I'm going to go get it. I know how much money I have to make to do it. And it may take me 10 years, but damn it, I'm going to have that house. I love it. When a good friend of mine was talking about her goals and manifestations saying, you know, with ease and joy at the end of it. <laughs> and, and the right reasons, like, because you put the last murder on the property. It's kind of, yeah, the property's not going cheap. It's like, yeah, just be very careful how you're setting your goals, right? Right. 
exactly. I want that house. Yeah, yeah, maybe you don't actually. Yeah, exactly. But you know, but you know, and that's that's also something too is that you know when you say that you you're when you're calling something into an existence, you also have to look at what is going, what are the obstacles in your way and what are the obstacles you're going to put in your way. A while ago, I talked about the, you know, the relationship with money, right? So if I want to get this house, I have to look at myself saying, if I'm earning, if my earning potential is this, right? So let's say, for example, I don't, I don't know how much this house is going to, actually, I do know how much it costs me, but let's just play in some numbers. If I think that this house is, if I think I'm going to have to raise $3 million to buy this house, right? I can't live in a life where I'm spending a million dollars a year on my lifestyle, right? You have to, you, that's just not going to work. And you're only, the only thing you're going to do is you'll be able to get credit to buy it, but you're going to be in debt. Who wants to be in debt, right? So you have to adjust your living. Live a little simple, simple. I mean, my gosh, there's only so much stuff that we can do with, with the things that we buy, Right. And I'm actually about ready to start cleaning out some rooms in my house because I have too much crap now. And, um, you know, so play the money game and, and make it win for you. If you want a new vehicle, you can't live. Like if you want a new SUV, you can't live as a single person that you require $5,000 a month. You have to scale that back down to $3,000 a month or whatever, right? You, you can't, you can't, expect to live lavishly and get what you really want out of life you have to shift and change the money relationship too and that's just one example right that's an example of an obstacle right and i think using that example if you look at it in other areas of life people are not willing to change the relationships they have with things in life to get ultimately what they want because they like what they have in the now versus looking at look i could have this in just a few short years. Are you, would you sort of at heart, would you be more of a saver or an investor? What do you sit there? I'm both. I'm actually a saver and an investor right now. And I've never been both in my entire life. Matter of fact, I was neither for a very long time. I was a spender. And now I am an investor and I'm a saver. And I, you know, I, which gives me the freedom to do things um, there's an entrepreneur that I pay very close attention to. His name is Bedros Cooley, and he's going to actually, he's actually my guest on my 100th episode. I'm flying out to California to record in his studio, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, but, you know, he talks about have the millionaire moment, you know, do things for yourself that are millionaire moments. And my millionaire moments is flying first class. If I fly, I fly first class because I work my heart out to get the funds to sit in first class. And it's just me, right? So again, I'm not hurting anybody, but at the same time, I feed myself that because when you're in first class, you also get exposure to life. So there's certain million dollar, millionaire moments that you can have. You can't have a millionaire moment every day. You just, you just can't do it. So, but there's, mm. you can pick a couple. Oh, I love it. Do you still vision board? Does that, does that still come into play with you? Goals and vision boarding? It does. Yep. It does. Yeah. That's good. So. so tell me if you were to describe your fire in the belly in one or two words, then what would it be? Have you ever heard me describe anything yet in one or two words? <laughs> just, I, I say one or two know. words. Everyone just completely ignores me. It just comes out with, <laughs> you know, it's like 15 minutes later. It's like, I genuinely said one or two words. Oh my gosh. I don't think I, I can do it. Fire in the belly. I, you know what? That's not true. I would say never give up. Love it. I think that's it. Never give up because I'm not a quitter. I never have been. Three words, by the way, but hey, <laughs> we'll, let, we'll let you slide. Dyslexic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. So tell us where can people reach out to you, follow you, track you down, hunt you down, stalk oh. you, any of the above. Love this question. So if you guys want to connect with me, by all means, you can connect me with me on just about any social platform. You can find me at Brenda, the HR lady. Um, LinkedIn, you'd have to use my name, which is Brenda Neckbottle. Um, or you can go to my website at Brenda, the .com and, and see what I'm up to. See all the good things that we've got out there to help people who are in the field of HR. Well, what Final message you'd like to leave with people? Final message. Um, 
you know what? Make 2021 your year. Don't let this COVID crap dictate what your outcome is going to be. And be okay with a barking dog in the background. Because <laughs> we are working from home. <laughs> Children, dogs, whatever. Right? Just suck it up. <laughs> it's okay. It, you don't have to be perfect. <laughs> just be there. That's all. Just, just turn be. Up. Yeah. In your pajamas, dog, kid, whatever. <laughs> That's right. It all goes. It's fine. Your husband comes up, gives you wet willy, you know, while you're in the <laughs> <laughs> well, It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for chatting today. And uh, yeah, listen, we, we wish you all the best. Look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you very much. I thank you for bringing me on. This has been this has been awesome. I've never really been able to tell my full cool story like that before. So this is great. So thank you. Thank you. Brenda, till the next time. Absolutely. Love you.